Welcome, one and all, alumni, faculty, friends, Deputy Provost, uh, Emily Bakemeyer. Welcome, one and all, to the 2011 Convocation and Reunion, and more particularly to this year's first Beecher Lecture. As you no doubt know, the Beecher Lecture has been held at Yale Divinity School since 1871. It was established by Henry Sage to celebrate the work of the famous 19th century divine, Lyman Beecher. And for 130 years, it has highlighted the work of famous pulpit orators. They have included Peter Hawkins with us today, Thomas Long, Barry Shepard, Otis Moss Jr., Barbara Brown Taylor, and a great cloud of powerful witnesses. Joining that distinguished company is today's lecturer, Brian Blount, who has had a career, a distinguished career, both as a pastor and a theological educator. He has been a professor of New Testament at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, and since the year 2007, he has been the president and professor of New Testament at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond. Your program details his services to the church and the world of biblical studies, and it also lists some of his many pub publications, including most recently, True to Our Native Land, an African-American New Testament commentary. I've known Brian personally through work in the Society of Biblical Literature, the main scholarly guild for us New Testament types. Most recently, I served with him on the finance committee of that organization. I guess there's something about uh, New Testament scholarship and the ability or willingness to work with numbers. In any case, it is a distinct pleasure to welcome to YDS this year's Beecher lecturer, Brian Blount. And after the lecture today, please join us for a reception in the common room. Thank you. Please pray with me. One more time, O oh God, you have called us together one more time. In your word, through your word, with your word, we are called here today. And we ask your blessings and your mercy on this gathering of good folk. We ask that you bless the preacher, the speaker, or whatever he chooses to do today. Lift him up, O oh God, and help him bring the best of what you have given him, and then a bit more. Open our hearts and our minds to the leading of your spirit. Help us to be guided, O oh God, by your justice. Help us to be filled with your spirit. And as we begin officially this first lecture, as we have this first day of convocation drawing to an end, we ask, O oh God, that you continue to shower your blessings on this gathering. Help this convocation be all that it needs to be and will be for those gathered here. Morning by morning, and day by day, and those gathered who could said, Amen. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 6. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you. I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you 
and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. A reading from the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 and 13 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white, the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for the people of God. It is a pleasure for me to be here in this, oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here in this wonderful setting to share with you today um, on some material that I have become very interested in. I've always been interested in apocalyptic, but more so in apocalyptic as it relates to the resurrection theme. And I'm deeply grateful to have this opportunity to share with you some of the thinking that I've been doing over the past year, past year and a half. Now, I must admit that um, I had a great deal of trepidation when um, I was asked to, um, or invited to give these lectures. I mean, it is quite an august company to be a part of. It is a little um, nerve wracking to begin to think about uh, being in the shoes of such persons. I also uh, wondered a great deal because of my administrative duties, uh, whether I'd have the time to spend on the lectures as I wanted to. So I want to thank my, um, my board chair and uh, my um, both past and current board chair, and both of them actually came here to be a, with me um, in this gathering today to show their support. When I told them that I was struggling about whether I'd have the time to do this, to commit to it, uh, the answer uh, from my past board chair was, look, you need to do it, and we need to give you the time to be able to do it. So because of that, um, I've been able to Um, cobble away a place in the library, go there and kind of hide and study to be able to work on these. So I want to make sure that I say thank you to them for making sure that I had the time to be here to be able to do this. It's been um, wonderful of them to show that kind of support and it's also wonderful of them to come and actually be here in this gathering as I do this today. Resurrection is a weapon. It is not a vindication for a life wrongly terminated. It is reinstigation for a battle rightly fought. It is not the climax that shadows God's crowning achievement on the cross. It is the shot that reignites a fiery engagement between forces claiming lordship over creation. It is not about a man. It is about a war. Resurrection is a weapon. Indeed, in a cosmic conflict where the almighty and creator God who has no equal is found inexplicably engaged by the forces of 
satanic sin and hellish death, resurrection is the weapon. The stakes are nothing less than life and its complete and eternal loss. To win, God must detonate a force as ferocious for life as God's enemies are vicious for death. Wielding the sword of slaughter and the crossbow of crucifixion, sin and death are poised for the most stunning of victories, unless God can unleash an even greater opposing power. On the violent and unforgiving battlefield upon which they meet, the evil that is the spawn of sin and death, given ruthless expression in the likes of Hitler's final solution, Eastern European and African ethnic cleansing, American chattel slavery and segregation, South African apartheid, the economic and political imperialism of the Roman Pax Romana, and examples too legion to number that evil cannot be absolved, its ruin expiated. One does not atone for sin and death. One engages and obliterates them. Resurrection is God's silver bullet. When Jesus of Nazareth is raised from the depths of Hades, it is as though God, manipulating the dirt of the earth like the muzzle of a gun, shot him straight through the heart of an enemy otherwise impervious to every strategic and tactical maneuver against it. Then and in the future to come, God triggers resurrection. It is resurrection that puts the enemies down. Resurrection's truth, resurrection's promise, and resurrection's literal reality must therefore be the primary proclamation of the apocalyptic preacher whom God deploys in God's formidable wake. That deployment makes the preacher God's weapon too. For the resurrection writer John of Patmos, the apocalyptic message that believers must affirm and preach in this combat context can be summed up in a simple phrase, dawn of the dead. Apocalyptic eschatology is fascinated with resurrection. The symbol that was most clearly expressed in the book of Daniel first took narrative flight and imagery unleashed by later Jewish and, apocalypt Jewish and Christian apocalyptic materials. An essential characteristic of apocalyptic eschatology is eschatological dualism, or more colloquially put, the doctrine of the two ages. To use John of Patmos' language, this present age is infested by the evil of a satanic red dragon and its two accomplice beasts. This eschatological dualism creates a moral dualism where right and wrong are as clearly differentiated as white and black. As the Christ followers in Laodicea learn, there is no lukewarm gray, no neutral ground. Radical options must be proclaimed. A radical choice must be made. That choice is made on a cosmic landscape. Apocalyptic eschatology, though concerned about the individual, combats a preoccupation with individual piety through a much broader and more important focus. What J. Christian Becker notes in his discussion of apocalyptic eschatology in the writings of Paul is more than appropriate for John. Quote, the human being is involved in the worldwide conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. In other words, there is no dualism between the human soul and the external world. The human being exists in the context of the world and its power structures, unquote. In this scenario, the present draws its meaning and purpose not from the transitory circumstance of evil having staked a claim over this age, but from the future certainty of God's imminent intervention. That intervention is more than a spiritual awakening. It is a social, historical, political, environmental, and indeed cosmic renewal and therefore liberation. In God's sure future act, this age and all those who have populated it will be transfigured and recovered. Evil's rule will become God's reign. As Revelation 24 through 5 implies, a literal bodily resurrection will be the tactical maneuver God deploys to bring that reign about. To appreciate res Revelation's resurrection strategy fully, one must engage it without the comforting blur of rationalizing literary or theological artifice through the lens of apocalyptic eschatology. 
The contemporary tendency, however, has been to demur. Rather than get drawn into the apocalyptic worldview and the ethics it may or may not require, contemporary Christians following a long line of established Christian theological and homiletical practice dehistoricize apocalyptic materials with Albert Schweitzer and Karl Barth, demythologize them with Rudolf Bultmann into their supposed existential essence, or remythologize them into some more figuratively, historically, or contextually appropriate postmodern ethnic, gender, cultural, political, or liberationist derivation. None of this is good for the apocalyptic <laughs> act that is God's historically invasive maneuver of resurrection. Simply put, in this contemporary age, it is difficult to proclaim a literal resurrection of the dead, individual, mass, or otherwise, with a straight face. What is a rational homiletician supposed to do with this imminent raising of the dead? Dehistoricize it, demythologize it, remythologize it, at the very least, invite a guest pulpiteer to preach it. <laughs> One of the contemporary ironies of this mainstream Christian skittishness about apocalyptic eschatology is that humankind in its secular guise is caught up in one of the most apocalyptic periods in recent historical memory. Liven Bove puts it well, quote, we are confronted today with a remarkable paradox. On the one hand, we live in a time in which apocalyptic ideas have virtually vanished from the Christian tradition, often on account of the dialogue between Christian faith and modernity. Apocalyst apocalypticism is too mythological, too dangerous, too literal, too speculative, too escapist. On the other hand, however, we are now faced with a post-Christian cultural environment in which apocalyptic is raising its head once again in the form of an apocalyptic sentiment, which expresses itself, among other things, in the fear of the physical end of the world, of the moral collapse of the human race, and the ultimate meaninglessness of human existence in every human aspiration of thought." Unquote. Well, this seems to be saying that in this resurgence of apocalyptic thinking, it is us Christians who are being left behind. <laughs> Driven by fears generated from two world wars, financial Armageddon's threat of nuclear and now environmental and pandemic annihilation, the 20th and 21st centuries have taken on an apocalyptic bearing in a secular guise. As Michael Barkin notes, these secular apocalyptic formulas are, quote, in every way the functional equivalent of their religious predecessors expressed in non-religious idioms from which the supernatural has been purged, unquote. So enthralled by this secular apocalyptic sensibility is our contemporary world that mainstream media has made a focused effort not only to pick up on the imagery but to warp it and capitalize from it. Stephen O'Leary chronicles four primary types of apocalyptic media that have surged in quantity and popular cultural re relevance. Monster movies, alien films, post-apocalyptic films, dramas of nuclear destruction. He neglects to mention just as broad an array of written materials, novels, graphic novels, nonfiction pieces whose storylines are driven by end-time apocalyptic symbolism. It is through a sharper focus on the end that the authors of these pieces hope to clarify our understanding of the now. In looking at the New Testament language of resurrection and dead, I endeavor to follow their creative cultural lead, but cautiously. To be sure, critics of apocalyptic eschatology have important and appropriate points to make. As Cook notes, the blind spots evident in apocalyptic sensibilities such as gender discrimination and ecological exploitation must neither be overlooked nor dismissed. They must be seriously engaged in a disciplined way through hermeneutical investigation. And yet neither must the text be domesticated. As he notes, quote, the harsh offensive qualities of the literature call not for dismissal but for critical engagement and interpretive sophistication, unquote. For my purposes, this effort of critical engagement implies two key points. First, apocalyptic theology is mythic and symbolic. Even at the risk of being offensive, the apocalyptic author's intent is to deploy striking imagery 
that seduces or shocks the reader into an altered state of perceiving herself, her world, and God's movement in them both. Second, to engage apocalyptic symbolism in a way that hermeneutically connects its meaning and message to our world, the interpreter must be willing to suspend traditional norms of belief. And indeed, we do this all the time, and happily so, and not just in the books we read or in the movies we go to, but also where traditional biblical and theological imagery is concerned. So David Jacobson writes, consider, for example, quote, when we allow the depth image of a symbol, say a broken loaf of bread, to call us, at least for a moment, out of our success anxieties to revel in the incalculable absurdities of grace, unquote. However, the elitism of intellectual sophistication and logic will too often conclude apocalyptic imagery senseless, inappropriate, and meaningless, even silly. Dismissing it and its contemporary popular interpretive applications such as science fiction and horror films and writings renders us incapable of learning how to reread our world and our time through apocalyptic imagery. John's dramatization of combat with the forces of Satan on a cosmic battlefield was his attempt to shock his followers who were accommodating themselves to Greek and Roman culture with the realization that they were embroiled in a war whose reality and contours they did not understand. The disturbing imagery was meant to wake them up, even if they did not fight in this war, or for that matter acknowledge that the war was taking place, the war's outcome would determine their destiny. Hermeneutically speaking, apocalyptic eschatology maintains today John's first century aim to wake hearers and readers to the devastating, devouring nature of their so-called normal existence, which brings us to the dead. John makes sense of the normal world of the living by appealing to the abnormal symbolism of the dead. Resurrection starts with the dead as either thing, condition, or place, whether in the lofty, limited confines of academic discourse or in the base but much more fun and sometimes more illuminating expanses of popular culture, dead is not a static concept. It is instead a tensive symbol, pregnant with meaning potential that is contextually accessed and therefore contextually sharpened and often hardened into a particular meaning. Consider the contextual perspective of one Joe Ledger, a popular culture creation in the middling thriller novel Patient Zero. Part soldier, part detective, as an emissary of the alleged living, Joe engages an agent of the dead. Javet lunged forward again, his fingers tearing at my shirt, his stink that of a carrion bird. No, no, that wasn't right, that wasn't it. Javet's smell was that of carrion. He smelled like the dead because he was dead. This whole train of thought shot through my brain in a microsecond at speed and clarity amplified by terror. Later, after surviving his odd encounter, Joe's terror is amplified even further when he learns that the dead man he encountered might be a harbinger of more dead men and women to come. In a conversation with a mysterious government supervisor whose outrageously unsubtle last name is Church, <laughs> Joe demands and receives an answer he does not want to hear. What was he? We were back at the table. They let me clean up in a bathroom. I showered and dressed and borrowed gym clothes. The shakes had started in the shower. Adrenaline accounted for a lot of it, but it was more than that. After 30 minutes, my hands were still trembling, and I didn't care if Church saw it. Church shrugged. We're still working on a name for his condition. Condition? That son of a gun was dead. <laughs> From now on, Church said, we may have to consider dead a relative term. Now, given these august surroundings, I would rather my quotes come from the likes of Ernest Hemingway, Toni Morrison, or William Shakespeare. But none of them address the pregnant meaning potential of dead the way that contemporary secular apocalyptic popular novels and movies do as a relative term whose meaning is capable of such imaginative and useful twisting. Though allegedly alive, we too are preoccupied by death. 
Perhaps we are so capable in our popular culture of imagining the walking dead because there are times when we who ostensibly comprise the living seem so much like them. Consider this striking narration by a severely burned Japanese grocer in the aftermath of the nuclear devastation of his city, Hiroshima. The appearance of people was, well, they all had skin blackened by burns. They had no hair because their hair was burned. And at a glance, you could not tell whether you were looking at them from in front or in the back. They held their arms bent forward like this. He proceeded to demonstrate their position and their skin, not only on their hands, but on their faces and bodies, too, hung down. If there had been only one or two such of these people, perhaps I would not have had such a strong impression. But wherever I walked, I met these people. I can still picture them in my mind like walking ghosts. They did not look like people of this world. They had a special way of walking very slowly. And I myself was one of them. Robert J. Lifton, who compiles this and other dramatic Hiroshima accounts, wonders in the telling where the line that separates life from death resides. He opines, quote, these Hiroshima memories then combine explicit end of the world imagery with a grotesque, dreamlike, non-natural situation a form of existence in which life was so permeated by death as to become virtually indistinguishable from it. I am interested in this relativity of dead because John of Patmos was also interested. John reconfigures dead by cloaking it in the accoutrements of life. Indeed, by the time he has finished, the dead and the living share so many traits that it is almost impossible to tell them apart. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had been given. They had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the work would be complete, both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters who were soon to be killed as they themselves had been killed. Are these killed souls dead or alive? If they are dead, why are they so animated? If they are alive, how is it that they have been killed? At 7.9 and 7.13 through 17, the potential for meaning is equally expansive and not to mention confusing. You heard the text read in the scripture. At the end, God will shelter them they will hunger no more, thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. These people died in the great ordeal and yet they do not seem dead at all. They live and yet they do not live as we live. They live somehow better because they are dead. At 24 through 5, John directly connects this dying and living, living and dying to the concept of resurrection. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image. They had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Beheaded. One does not get much more dead than that. Executed by a satanically inspired imperial beast and its local proxy governments, the human and institutional representations of death and Hades on earth. And yet these beheaded folk live and reign with Christ, not in heaven this time, but on earth right here. The living, presumably walking, definitely ruling dead. They take over the earth as a part of God's first resurrection, a first resurrection that is the prelude to a massive, universal, literal dawn to life for all the dead. What are these living dead? And perhaps more importantly, what do they see when they look at us? I spent most of my academic career focused on cultural interpretation, reading and interpreting the text through the lens of particular cultures, especially my own African-American culture. 
I do this because I work from the premise that language is a cultural phenomenon that is constructed and then deconstructed, decoded, and subsequently interpreted contextually. The words, sentences, and paragraphs that comprise narrative text do not contain meaning, but meaning potential. That potential is culturally appropriated. It is therefore not odd to me that people from different cultural locations can read the same biblical text and derive a different meaning from it. I understand that they may well have accessed different segments of the text overall meaning potential. The difficulty arises, of course, when one cultural reader demands that his or her particular access of that meaning potential is all the meaning the text has to offer. This fascination with the cultural location of an interpreter and the impact that location has on the meaning an interpreter derives from a text or circumstance drives me to perhaps a morbid but certainly fascinating question. What meaning does an executed soul living either in heaven now or on earth following what John calls the first resurrection of the dead attribute to the meaning potentiality of the term living? a term that we who occupy this historical age religiously claim for ourselves. In this historical age, our reality and our truth are bound up in the myth of our aliveness. We are alive. Go ahead, pinch the person next to you, see if that person doesn't squirm. <laughs> alive. But if the souls in heaven that John chronicles in chapters 6, 7, and 20 are alive, then since we are distinct from them, we must be, by definition, something else. At least we are something else, according to John's apocalyptic viewpoint that reveals the truth about, quote, unquote, life. Life is direct proximity to God in the heavenly throne room and ultimately direct proximity to God here on earth. The pre-understanding that derives from this direct relationship with God is described in 7.16 as existence without sadness or mourning, and then later at 21.4 as devoid even of death. This, for John, is what life looks like. You don't have to spend two or three years doing biblical exegesis in a seminary or a divinity school to ascertain that John's life bears little resemblance to our lives. What then are we? Some degree of dead, distant from God, in direct proximity in this age to the animate power that John calls death in Hades, living itself out through the satanic possession of the beasts from the sea and the land. Lifton's observation about the Japanese memories in the aftermath of the Hiroshima bomb describes the condition of our entire historical age with equal precision. Quote, a form of existence in which life is so permeated by death as to become virtually indistinguishable from it. Unquote. Living dead. Walking dead. It is, of course, the pop culture image of the zombie. The zombie has become so ingrained in secular apocalyptic popular culture, so potent a science fiction theme that even the most highly regarded of contemporary scientific institutions have taken notice of it. And so on May 19, 2011, an article by CNN can note, quote, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a big, serious government agency with a big, serious job protecting public health from threats ranging from hurricanes to bird flu. So when the good doctors of Atlanta warn people this week about how to prepare for a zombie apocalypse, the world took notice, unquote. In his book, Gospel of the Living Dead, Kim Paffenfroth sees secular apocalyptic symbolism at play. Quote, more than any other monster, zombies are fully and literally apocalyptic, as the movies acknowledge they signal the end of the world as we have known it for thousands of years. Also, in the original meaning of apocalyptic, they reveal terrible truths about human nature, existence, and sin, unquote. Like the book of Revelation, these tales contain scenes of graphic, usually unspeakable violence, often including the most sickening acts of cannibalism and dismemberment depicted in excruciating detail with rivers and geysers of blood. 
These stories shock us with their portrayal of the depths of depravity to which we humans are capable of descending. And yet in some more firm ways, using and even delighting in the strangest form of humor, the symbolism is meant to share not only what humans are capable of, but what humans have already become. For example, the portrayed cannibalism is a wicked play on the human tendency to consume each other and the environmental space we inhabit. In this grotesque world, humans and monsters often become hard to distinguish, and Paffenfroth says, quote, and therefore the moral rules that God are dealings with humans, it is better to suffer injustice than to commit it, thou shalt not kill, love thy neighbor, turn the other cheek, are discarded as irrelevant and unfeasible, unquote. Indeed, there are moments when the humans seem less human than the walking dead they struggle to overcome. Paffenforth again, quote, The zombie's victory is facilitated in all the movies by the humans' constant inability to cooperate with one another, an inability frequently exacerbated by racism, while the zombies themselves, though usually oblivious to one another, are always a multi-ethnic mob whose violence is always directed outward, unquote. It is tongue-in-cheek social criticism that strikes a devastating blow at the pride that humans are creation's exceptional creatures. A final quote from Paffenfroth. It is the most extreme and funniest reversal that the world once dominated by humans who so arrogantly and stupidly suppose that they are the smartest, most advanced, and most important life forms in the universe is destroyed pretty easily by an apocalyptic army, not of powerful supernatural beings like Satan or the Antichrist, but of slow, clumsy imbeciles who can barely stand up. The whole idea of zombies taking over the world is both a funny and potent parable against human hubris, arrogance, and self-sufficiency." Unquote. Zombies are a metaphor for conflict and catastrophe. In a literal sense, there has been some devastation, biological, nuclear, or so forth. In a figurative sense, the reader, the viewer, is compelled to compare the walking dead reality to his or her own natural reality and thereby realize what John was trying to get his readers to understand, what we call normal life is itself a crisis situation. We simply do not see it yet. To make the point more fine, we are not waiting for the walking dead. We already are the walking dead. We will not be one day running from zombies. We are, via the angle of the contextual lens used by the souls in heaven, already zombies. This is the normal crisis we live with every day, have lived with every day since Adam's unfortunate infelicity in the garden. Contemporary apocalyptic hermeneutics needs recognition of no other crisis, event, or moment. It needs nothing other than our normal symbolic existence as the living dead. Perhaps this is, in the end, through its symbolism, a helpful image for persons preaching to a faltering American church, becoming smaller and less powerful by the day, on a cultural island as the secular world takes over, and more and more its adherents become the outsiders and the outcasts, the remnant struggling against the overwhelming tide. What is it that the church should seek and the preacher should preach? Life in the heavenly realm to be sure, but what about here? What is possible here in a world that is by definition separate from God? A world occupied by those of us who within the church and without are by definition then the animate dead. What should we preach to this world? Resurrection. But to understand the apocalyptic significance of resurrection, we must first appreciate the meaning of death. We begin by preaching the truth that the symbolism of the apocalypse conveys. Dead is a relative term. So is life. One cannot comprehend the truth of one without counterposing it against the other. I would make the case that John understands four levels of creaturely human existence. Life, dead, dead, dead and living dead. Life we have earlier described by way of allusion to texts like 6, 9, 11, 7, 9 through 17, and 24 through 5. Life is existence in direct proximity to God. At 210, the child of humanity voices a paradox, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is the ethic of life imaged in the heavenly throne room. Those who are faithful in their witness to the Lordship of Christ, though they are killed for that stubbornness, shall be rewarded with something they have heretofore not possessed, life. 
Indeed, in all of the letters to the seven churches, John concludes with a comparable promise about the reward of life, which is by definition that time and space when the believer is in proximate relationship with God for all of time. Life is easy. Death is mesmerizing in its complexity. There is first what I would call type A death, or more colloquially put, dead. <laughs> to be dead is to have one's earthly existence terminated. This is the kind of death John alludes to at 9-6. It is the type of death associated with the preliminary acts of judgment that follow the opening of the first six seals, the sounding of the first six trumpets, and the pouring out of the first six bowls. It is type A death to which John refers at 2:23 when the child of humanity warns that he will strike the children of Jezebel dead. It is type A death that the fourth apocalyptic horseman brings at 6-8. Babylon's death at 18-8 is type A death. Type A death brings a merciful end to the preliminary judgment acts of God. But if type A death is meted out as a punishment for those who resist God and persecute God's witnesses, it is also used against God's witnesses as a means of stamping that witness out. Antipas, an exemplar witness, suffers type A death at 2.13. 6.11 promises that many witnesses will soon suffer type A death. The two prototypical and metaphorical witnesses suffer type A death at 11.7. Clearly, the beheaded witnesses of 24 through 5 suffered a similar fate. Type A death does not discriminate. Sooner or later, it comes to believer and non-believer alike. Being dead, though, is a fate better than death itself. John's hearers and readers know that being type A dead is not final because there are multiple occasions in the narrative where the seer confirms that life exists beyond it. Even the mortally wounded beast can be resurrected beyond type A death. At 2013, those captured by death rise to new life. One of the benefits for those who enjoy life will be the complete cessation of type A death. Beyond being type A dead, though, there is dead dead. We will call it type B death. According to 2.11, those who have been faithful witnesses in their first life will not endure a second death. This second type B death is for John a permanent cessation of existence. It is a death that follows a guilty verdict at the final judgment. Type B death then is the death one should fear. Revelation 20.13 indicates that at God's final judgment, a decision will be made as to whether those who have died type A death will be accorded life or type B death. God makes this ruling on the basis of how a person has lived his or her historical existence. Now, while type B death is to be avoided at all costs, there are some circumstances where type A death is preferable even to historical existence. This historical existence, in other words, is so problematic that it is not the reward one seeks, but the destiny one ultimately hopes to overcome. The bleakest of historical circumstances involve humans like those of 9-6, who seek type A death as an escape from the torture of the demon locust. They surely do not long for type B death, which is a permanent cessation, but release from this historical age and the struggles it represents. Even believers, witnesses to the lordship of Christ, may and often do prefer type A death to the persecution that comes from living out their faithful testimony. Indeed, it is by acting out their faith in such a relentless way that they may not only meet type A death, but they may also conquer the evil satanic presence that wields it. This death is so transitory that it is not to be feared. Death, in John's apocalyptic imagination, then, is clearly not a static concept. It is a fluid, symbolic reality that allows for movement. It is relative. One enters it, one moves beyond it to a second, more final form of death or to life. That life is presently with God in the heavenly realm, or anticipated with Christ during his earthly, re his earthly reign, or on the reconfigured earth symbolized as the new Jerusalem. But it does not exist in this historical age. What we have here in this historical age is something else, something that is an antitype of the no mourning, no dying, and no darkness that typifies the new heaven and the new earth. What we have here is something that mimics living, but is akin to being dead. It is an age ruled by a satanic dragon and the beast operating at its behest. It is existence under constant pressure and duress, especially for those who would witness against the lordship of the dragon and its beast. 
It is in its purest apocalyptic sense an evil age, an age typified by the characteristics of death. Those of us who exist here, though not type A dead and surely not type B dead, are also, I would say, not alive, though we do oddly mimic the living who look down upon us with both horror and empathy from the heavenly throne room. Here we are consumed by a satanic dragon and its imperial, imperial forces that rule this age. Here we are consumed. In an imitative response, we consume one another and the environment we inhabit. It is no wonder that the symbolic language that I think best fits our circumstance is living dead. For God to save us, God must invade. God's primary weapon is resurrection, the Lamb's and then ours. In her wonderful essay on whether apocalyptic can be relevant to our time, Sophie Laws conjectured that in the book of Revelation, the apocalyptic perspective is altered in the light of the cross. It is a potent statement that belies the fact that the word cross never appears in the apocalypse, and the single reference to the verb crucify at 1118 is more a historical reference than a theological starting point. To be sure, at 1.5, John does mention that Jesus redeemed humankind from their sins by his blood. Curiously, though, if this is a point that he wants to develop as fully as, say, the Apostle Paul, why does he never mention the point again? In fact, one might even argue that at 1.5, John's central focus is not on Christ's death as much as it is on his identity as the faithful witness who is the firstborn of the dead the first resurrected one. This witness made to suffer because of that witness comes back from the dead to witness in resurrected life. It is as though this resurrection makes the point that his witness and the claim to lordship it represented despite, not because of, but despite the fact of his slaughter is true. At 118, Christ self-proclaims that now as the resurrected one he lives his life now is distinct from what it was before. He was dead, but now he lives. And that invasive resurrection came with a spoil of war, the keys to death and Hades. Christ has the keys, and can and will therefore unlock the doors of death and Hades and liberate all who have been consigned to their type A death by the satanic dragon and its imperial beasts. This is the saving resurrection message that John repeats over and over again throughout his apocalypse. Christ does not save because he died. Christ saves because resurrected, he lives. And in living, he holds the key that unlocks life. To be sure, in chapter 5, the lamb is worthy because he was slaughtered, but is that the worthiness of an atoning lamb slaughter in John's revelation? The work of Lauren Johns is particularly helpful here. Looking at the rhetorical force of the lamb's symbolism in the apocalypse, Johns, after surveying the lamb imagery in early Judaism, concludes that, quote, there is no evidence at this point to establish that anything like a recognizable redeemer lamb figure in its apocalyptic traditions is at work in the Re book of Revelation, unquote. John would therefore not have expected his readers to connect the lamb's suffering slaughter to their own redemption. In fact, after a survey of the Hebrew Bible, John's concludes that, quote, the terminology used in the apocalypse does not fit well with the lambs of the sacrificial system, unquote. In fact, John doesn't restrict slaughter language to the lamb. John thus argues, Lauren Johns thus argues, that slaughter language of the lamb at 5-6 is not primarily expiatory. In fact, he argues that, quote, there is little in the apocalypse of John to support this understanding of Jesus' death as atonement, unquote. Indeed, it is also difficult to imagine what kind of atonement could possibly assuage death. Death has a voracious appetite. It is hard to imagine a single killing of any kind satisfying it. Why would death accept even the highest profile killing or a massive amount of killing as a payment for a future existence freed from death? For death to operate so would be for death to operate against its own expansive interests. Even death must know that a kingdom so divided against itself will not long stand. In John's narrative context, the lamb is worthy because he did what all the believers are expected to do. He witnessed even when faced with death. His worthiness resides in his witnessing. His witnessing is the effort that John's followers, like John himself, are called to emulate. 
in the broader thematic apocalyptic context where this age is in the grip of the powers that wield death and humans are by all accounts the living dead, dying even on a cross neither gets one notice nor dramatically alters the situation on the ground. The dead simply do not notice other dead. And the purveyors of death rejoice whenever death occurs to whomever it occurs because they have one more entity to lock away in Hades. Adding to the dead is not a drawback for those committed to making the relativity of death a static reality forever in Hades. In a world typified by death, killings, even high-profile killings, do not raise a transforming alarm. In a world typified by death, what brings notice that something transformative is on the loose is life in the face of death. Life even after death. Life in spite of death. Life that unlocks the doors and thus breaks the power of death. What the purveyors of death notice is defiant life. It is resurrection that frightens them. As Martinus de Boer recognizes, Christian thinking modifies Jewish apocalyptic at just this point. Quote, the hour of the eschaton was not as in Jewish apocalyptic eschatology about to strike. It had already struck and God's raising of Jesus from the dead, an apocalyptic eschatological event, unquote. The dramatic turn of the ages from an age captive to satanic power to an age where satanic power has been overturned occurs with the Lamb's rise from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is God's ultimate weapon. When John repeatedly warns at the opening and close of his work that this resurrected Christ is coming soon, he's sounding the alarm for a grand sweeping universal invasion. By engaging the trigger of Christ's resurrected return, God will detonate the dawn of all the dead to life. The dead will rise up and invade our space, the space of this historical era, the space of the living dead, overwhelming it and transforming it into a realm of life. Only life can conquer death. In this final resurrection, God will have made that point perfectly clear. Our homiletical task, then, is to anticipate the reality and effect of God's resurrection point in our contemporary resurrection preaching. Surely this is what John means when he says they conquered him through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of their testimony. Through their testimony, they participated in God's conquest of the powers that haunt this age. Through their testimony to resurrection life with God, they conquered death. Their testimony was to the lordship of the resurrected lamb, whose own resurrection was a harbinger of theirs to come. For John to preach the truth and power of that resurrection is to conquer. For John to preach the truth and power of that resurrection is to give God's end-time invasion a potent real-time effect. Our homiletical task, then, is to overcome our modern and postmodern skittishness and proclaim the contemporary relevance of this imminent dawn of the dead through the revealing lens of both religious and secular apocalyptic eschatology. We begin by preaching in ways that challenge our current worldview, in ways that force us to see that we humans are not in charge of the world we call our own, that we are in the midst of a crisis we do not fully comprehend arrogantly convinced that we live. We do not fully appreciate the consequence of having been captured by death, walking unwittingly under its control. Preaching apocalyptic eschatology in this circumstance is not, as Bove helpfully puts it, simply a matter of devastation, catastrophe, and chaos. It is also one of perspective, revelation, and disclosure. And that is why contemporary Christian apocalyptic preaching calls for a shift from catastrophe thinking to crisis thinking. The crisis is prompted by the truth of our condition. The truth apocalyptic preachers must be committed to preaching. We are the living dead. The pertinent questions now are, how do we crisis preach to congregations of living dead who are committed to the conceit that they are alive? And what will such preaching do and mean for the way we walking dead Christians engage our work and our world? The first thing I think preachers do is embrace the secular apocalyptic imagery streaming in at us from popular culture. 
embrace it and reconfigure it so that it becomes capable of carrying the New Testament apocalyptic message. Already secular apocalyptic imagery targets Christian perspectives, attacking and disrupting while we go blithely on our pious ways. The longer we stand by and watch creatively helpless, the more like a vacant, desolate zombie land our faith tradition becomes. In its zombie imagery, contemporary culture is laughing at biblical apocalyptic eschatology and its core weapon of resurrection, and many Christians do not seem to get the joke. Worse, many Christians do not even seem to realize that there is a joke. The idea of the walking dead, the zombie, is a secular caricature of apocalyptic resurrection symbolism that has no creative response from the Christian homiletical side. The secular imagery promotes a world-ending catastrophe that yet allows us to live on as if alive yet, yet dead, a mock, general, and invasive resurrection. Those who escape the initial holocaust are hunted down by the imperialism of the walking dead who seek out all who are not their kind, consuming some, infecting others, evangelizing in their own way until the world becomes all their own. This is an apocalyptic invasion of sorts, but it is an invasion aimed at taking life rather than giving it. It is the same image John intends in the general resurrection of the dead who approach the new Jerusalem. They too are an army. They too capture and control, but they capture death and install life. How will they do it? Impossible in this historical era to say since we do not have the explanatory constructs, but Perhaps to borrow from contemporary secular apocalyptic imagery, it will be a polar opposite zombie phenomenon. The resurrected living, fanning out in indefatigable waves, consuming the living dead, infecting the living dead with the virus of resurrection life, and transfiguring them. Yes, it's silly. This is the true apocalyptic stumbling block of our faith. Not, I would contend, a crucified leader anymore. There are martyrs aplenty, but there was only one raised from the dead to reign at the right hand of God, who is also the firstborn of all the dead, will imminently raise. That is the true lunacy. But that is also the heart of the apocalyptic gospel and the place where the apocalyptic preacher must begin. Not on the cross, but with the raising of the dead. The raising of the one, the raising of the many, the dawn of the dead. That is the symbolism of resurrection as, as a weapon aimed at engaging, transfiguring, and then reclaiming this death-dealing historical age that is infested by the walking, living dead. This proclamation must be anything but lukewarm. Having made the hearer cognizant about the truth of this world, the apocalyptic preacher makes a purposeful and somewhat controversial choice. As Jones and Sumner declare in their work preaching apocalyptic texts, quote, the apocalyptic preacher forces a collision between the world that is and a world she or he imagines or anticipates, unquote. And then the preacher forces the hearer to decide, exist in the world of the living dead, or enlist as a fighting member of the advanced forces who prepare for the resurrection dawn. Becker makes the point well, quote, God's act in Christ focuses our attention on the present time as an apocalyptic time, that is, on the either or of our allegiance. Do we either serve Christ or the powers of this world, unquote. Sophie Laws understands that this kind of apocalyptic theological commitment may provide support for a real theology of liberation rather than of a development or evolution and for a hope of freedom expanded to a cosmic dimension. I am reminded of Martin Luther King Jr.'s explanation of why African Americans could not wait for freedom and civil rights to evolve in his letter from a Birmingham jail. The time for lukewarm waffling was done. A definitive stand had to be taken. Either one was operating for life or committed to the forces of living death. There was in such a case no true middle ground. There never is when the opposing realities are death, even living death, and life. The apocalyptic preacher standing from a perch where he can see the resurrection dawn is committed to preaching and inciting life. And what does this mean concretely? It means focusing on the invasion symbolism, but focusing on God's invasive maneuver as the insurgency of life rather than death. Martyrdom, suffering, and dying are not the transfiguring goal of God's invasive strategy so conceived. 
The primary ethic in John's apocalypse is that wit believers should witness for the lordship of the resurrected lamb, not that they should die for that message. John was no less a witness because he did not lose his life but was exiled instead. Yes, in certain circumstances, such witnessing may well cost a believer his or her life. Every believer should be willing to pay that price. And yet the goal of witnessing is not death but the proclamation of new life initiated by God's resurrection of the Lamb and God's impending resurrection of all the dead. And that means, in the end, preaching the resurrection as fervently and more often than preaching the cross. Preaching resurrection is not just for Easter anymore. We must find a way to image it, to affirm our expectation for it, and to find ways to recast it in contemporary symbolism that connects with our contemporary age. But how to do it? How would we symbolize ourselves to the world if the symbol were not a cross, an image of death to which the living dead can certainly relate, but the dawn of life? For John, it was the new Jerusalem. What about the 21st century when Jerusalem is a contested historical site that images more of the living dying that we're trying to overcome than the resurrected possibilities to which we aspire? Can we image resurrection? Can we give sharp focus to God's dawn of the dead in a positively meaningful and serious way? I would argue that the very attempt would immobilize us. And perhaps that is a good thing because we will not be able to do with God's ultimate invasive strategy what we have done with the cross. I have noticed how Christians chafe at branding language as if that is a commercial, secular perversion that we folk of faith avoid. And yet, in the way we treat it, the Nike swoosh and the golden arches of McDonald's have nothing on the Christian cross. We have branded ourselves with a cross in a way that is almost impossible where resurrection is concerned. We cannot hang resurrection around our necks, stick resurrection on our walls, hold resurrection up before our causes. We cannot domesticate it, control it, contain it, and perhaps that is exactly how it ought to be. Because in that moment of inability, we are faced with the realization that we are part of something much larger than ourselves, something we cannot form, hold, or manipulate. And yet, as apocalyptic preachers, we are called, I believe, to incite our listeners to, con to conjure the symbolism of resurrection in the way that John so successfully crafts the powerful image of the New Jerusalem. It is not an image we can control. Who can control the idea of a city descending from heaven? But it is an image that invites participation. How do I become a citizen of it? The very question compels creative action. How do I help build it? It ought to be difficult to sing the poetic song of the New Jerusalem without wanting to help build it and find citizenship within it, no matter the cost. And that may well be John's point. John was preaching to a church struggling to survive, struggling by all accounts against the very trajectory of history. John's instruction was that his anti-Roman believers should engage history's trajectory in Rome's future by standing up and witnessing to an anti-Roman truth that would force Rome's representatives to engage, punish, and perhaps even destroy them. The seven churches were a community of believers facing literal and figurative and literal death. John pressed them to stand in the face of that death and jeer it by declaring allegiance to the resurrection of their Lord. In my own family history and individual research, I've used the imagery of African American slaves and the civil rights movement as illustrative examples. They are important to me because they represent the living dead, humans owned by other humans, humans declared by constitutional mandate to be three-fifths of other humans, humans segregated and cordoned off from polite society because they were in some way subhuman. These people envisioned an embodied resurrection, and then they used it as a weapon. They preached exodus when they were in Egypt. They drew education down from the sky when there was no legal opportunity for it on this earth. They faced down dogs and police and water cannons and entire regions of hostility when there seemed no safe way around. Because they glimpsed what resurrection was beyond slavery, resurrection beyond segregation looked like, and then embodied it, preached it, even though the very living of it brought more of the living death force of slavery and segregation down upon their heads. They lived resurrection until they participated in the unleashing of resurrection. They use resurrection as a weapon. In this world preoccupied 
and identify with death, the idiom of death no longer stands out on the human horizon. It no longer captures the spiritual imagination. It is no longer a stumbling folly or intellectual foolishness to believe a Messiah can be killed. We know death. We are death. We do not get what we do not get, what strikes us as unfathomable, unfathomable, foolishly beyond our reach, is life. We certainly do not get what it means, having envisioned that future, to bring it to life in the here and now. Resurrection stands out in this world because resurrection is not normal, makes no true sense in this age. How do we find a way like the African-American slaves and the civil rights protesters who were their offspring to mimic prophetic invasive behavior in our everyday encounters of social, political, economic, and ecclesial life? How do we envision the invasive moment of outrageous new life into the midst of normal dying and then realize that vision in our preaching and in our living the way God realized Jesus is rising from the dead and now intends to realize our own? Our preaching task is to help our communities of the living, faithful, dead figure out how to make such an envisioned force of life invasion come about. Our task is to make the descriptive mantra of the little boy in the movie The Sixth Sense become a prescriptive agenda for the community of faith. Our preaching task is to make the entire world see dead people and not just see us for all of what we are, the living dead, but to commission our communities of living dead to engage a visible agenda of resurrection as participants in the cosmic war which God has already engaged. Let me conclude with a memory. This summer I had the good fortune to journey with some friends to Turkey and Patmos to visit the archaeological sites where the people who populated John's churches once lived. I thought of John's people as the remains of the great temples of Greco-Roman lordship loomed across the horizon, vast and mighty beyond all compare. And I thought of John's little house churches and the people huddling within, wondering how they were going to compete with all of that. And I heard John telling them to use Jesus' resurrection as their weapon, to see the future of Jesus' lordship and to live that future no matter what the cost. A friend on our journey told me that he heard that message, and it frightened him. And he wanted me to help him do something with either the message or the fear. The message of John to witness to the resurrection life in the midst of death is frightening because who can live like that all the time? You see injustice, and you want to speak to justice. You see impoverishment, and you want to speak to a sharing of resources, mine and yours. You see entire waves of people destroyed by prejudices and oppression, and you know that to live resurrection, to see and enact equality and liberation, is to be drawn into a fight you are not sure you can win. But you do know the cost will be high. And yet we have our own lives to live, the futures of our own families to protect. How can we tend to both simultaneously? We cannot. But then how can we live with ourselves? I do not know what to tell him about living with both the desire to live resurrection and the simultaneous fear that to do so may bring figurative and perhaps literal death instead. I did not know what to tell a person in that moment as we were traveling. I do not know what to tell a person now might happen after they fire a weapon. I only know to keep telling them that in a war they are called to fire it to fire resurrection in the midst of living death, no matter the cost, a radical apocalyptic choice. Final popular culture reference. I was still thinking about that friend when I read some appealing, inviting reviews earlier this year about this novel, The Last Werewolf. <laughs> Let me tell you something, do not read the book. <laughs> it is violent. It is sexual, it is faithless, it is distressing. It is also very funny, incredibly irreverent, and extremely well written. But all that's beside the point. It is hard to read because it narrates the life of a man who is the very epitome of living death. He has lived for centuries in a cursed state of virtual death, unleashed on the full moon to draw death down upon others. The curse makes him a missionary of death. 
It is odd to be drawn inside the mind of a monster who knows that he is a monster, but knows he can do nothing other than the monstrous things because of the curse that possesses him. It is odd to feel sympathy for a monster. It is creepy to wonder whether a monster resides inside me as well. There must have been 15 times that I put that novel down and said, I can't read this thing anymore. And 15 times I picked it back up because I had to know what was going to happen next to this man who brings death to life. And then there was a moment after I turned the last page when it dawned on me that the reason I do not have an answer for my friend is that there are no answers, at least in this lifetime, for a curse. And we are living dead under the spell of a curse. John, bound on Patmos, drawn up to the heavens after he had been thrown down to the earth, cannot escape the visions as horrible as they are and cannot let his people escape them either. Cursed. Those slaves and those marchers seeing mountaintops while they were being destroyed in the valleys of life could not escape the visions of the future and could not let their people escape them either. Cursed. Cursed with the vision of the future in the midst of the present. It is the curse of resurrection life that infects us living dead. The curse of a resurrected Lord who promises resurrection to us all. Like the voracious fever that relentlessly returns and drives a lion into a pack of wildebeest, the dizzying, insane pull of resurrection, the madness to resurrect justice and wholeness and circumstances and people writhes within us and resists our damnable determination to just keep blending in to our historical era's massive company of the walking, living dead. We are then, like John, cursed with the task of finding and proclaiming a contemporary poetic image that sings this song of resurrection, that uncovers the truth about our age, that we are the living dead, and reveals the truth about God's past and planned invasion in a way that summons the living dead to enlist in God's war effort. Some image like the dawn of the dead. Thank you. <laughs>